Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. All right, let's welcome our first speaker, Ted R. from San Francisco, California, and he'll speak for approximately 20 minutes. I'm an alcoholic. My name's Ted. We love you, Ted. Lots and lots and lots. Oh, my heart is. Great. Uh, that's, that's nice. Uh, <laughs> wow. You know, it, it's, I was just sitting there trying to figure out the schedule, how it was going to be, who was going to go first. And uh, sometimes it's nice not knowing. And sometimes I'd rather know. But anyway, um, so there's topics on the table, and then Tom says, we're supposed to talk on these topics, and I didn't know if that was the truth, because I didn't get that much instruction. And, and my topic was, can I ever dance again? <laughs> then he said, it was from the ask it basket from the previous meeting or something. I, 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 I think uh, genius is... Will I ever find... Where are the sluts in AA? (laughs) I don't know. I I went home early. Uh, So, let's see. You know, I wasn't sure. People were asking me all week, uh, what is the panel about? And I said, I guess it's about being gay. And uh, it's just the... uh, (laughs) Or being awesome. I don't know. Um, So, I get... I said to her once, my sister's here up front, and uh, I said to her once before she joined AA two and a half years ago, um, she said, what, when you go to those meetings, what do you talk about? And I said, I didn't want to go into de- detail, so I said, myself. <laughs> and she said, that should be easy. <laughs> so it's, it's true. Um, if I, if I just remember, I just have to tell my own experience and tell my own truth and, and not get really into comparing myself to other people. It was great. I mean, I've heard some, like seven really great speakers already. And I just have been here since five yesterday. And I mean, everybody just almost brings me to tears. I'm, uh, so filled with gratitude to be sober and to make myself available for this. First of all, be willing to show up and willing to face my own, uh, challenges of insecurity and feelings of low self-esteem and I'm not old enough, I'm not gay enough, I'm not, I'm too old, I'm too gay. You know, it's it's all, it's all, uh, there's always something. (laughs) And uh, if I just get comfortable with being uh, one way, then I, then I worry about being the other way. So um, my sobriety date is 1185. Uh, It's been a long 26 years. And um, my home group is the Tiburon Men- Monday Men's Stag. I do the 6 o'clock step study and the 8 o'clock speaker discussion. If you're ever in Tiburon and you're a male, welcome. And um, that's it. I have a sponsor. He lives in Norm in Edmond, Oklahoma. He moved there, um, I think he had a moment of insanity. And, uh, you know, he's old, so I thought it was senile. Uh, but he just announced to me after 20 years of sponsoring me in San Francisco... He said that it was time for him to be a grandfather and move back to Oklahoma where he had left a daughter who was now, who had children and he was going to go back to Oklahoma and be a grandfather. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. I, I mean, uh, that he was stepping into that role and, uh, that's what he's, he's demonstrated for me throughout the years about growth and change and, um, and we, we step up when, when the time comes. So, Let's see, uh, I came into, uh, real quick, I, I know a lot of you, I'm not going to go into it because it's only 20 minutes and I could talk a while about just how it was. So I got uh, drunk in, at 15, I stayed drunk until 30, I drank in San Francisco, for, I got drafted and sent to the Presidio of San Francisco, yes I was in the army, and um, I was closeted, uh, that's a lot to get in a closet, and... Uh, <laughs> It was hard. It was difficult to uh, stay, you know, under the radar in the army. But uh, they told me I was a disgrace to the uniform. 
and I knew I was, and uh, I slept in it every night, and uh, so it wasn't like spit, shine, and polished. It, it, I wasn't that kind of a soldier. I, I worked at uh, Letterman Hospital. I drank every day. Got out of the Army. I moved in with some three straight guys in Noe Valley. I stayed closeted. I drank every day. Um, we sat around and played dominoes and cards and drank beer and Talk, and they talked a lot about women, what they'd do if they ever had one. And uh, <laughs> I just went along with it. Yeah, I'd, I might do the same thing. Uh, <laughs> I knew there was no danger of it because we were all such alcoholics. Uh, nobody had the courage to ask anyone out. So I stayed in that situation for three years, three years too long. Um, started sneaking men in and out of that house. And then uh, I drank in San Francisco from 1970 to 1980. I came into Alcoholics Anonymous through 18th Street Service in the Castro. I did that program for three months. I stayed clean and sober through that three months. And um, I, I was um, my counselor there said, what's your plan to stay sober? And I said, I'm going to, um, I'm doing just fine. And he said, what's your plan? And I said, I'm going to go to the I-Beam every night and dance. So it was so appropriate that he gave me that. Uh, so the, And he said, wow, that plan might not work. And I said, it's working great. Three months I've got. You know, that was a huge amount of time. I was a real day counter. I was a real circle the calendar. Mark, uh, my calendar looked like hieroglyphics. You know, when I had my last cigarette, last anonymous sex, last Weight Watchers meeting. You know, I was really obsessed with self. And uh, I, I was really obsessed with self. So at that stage, I went to nursing school the first four years of my sobriety. And that became my objective. I didn't really want to reach out, and I didn't want to join AA. I had a goal. I'd been at City College for 12 years. And uh, <laughs> so I really wanted to get out of co uh, junior college. And um, so I, I went to uh, nursing school. I graduated from nursing school. And at that time, at that time, I was at the jumping off place. I couldn't live with alcohol, and I couldn't live without it. I was four years dry. And I went to a meeting after taking the state boards. And I was working at the general uh, in the psych units, and I went to a meeting, and I, and I heard a sponsor. I, I heard a man speaking who became my sponsor, and he was talking about the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and the traditions and um, the book. And I had not read the book, but my, my smart-ass reply was always, I'm waiting for the movie. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't like to read. I'm waiting for the movie. And... Uh, that's my attitude. You know, my, my attitude to newcomers was, for four years was throw those numbers away. You don't want these people to call you. They're very sick. <laughs> so, I, you know, that's what I, I was really helpful. Um, people had asked me to go, go to coffee or something. I, I just would say, I have things to do. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't waste my time in AA. And uh, so I did AA four years that way. And then I met this guy who was enthusiastic. And he pulled me out of the what he calls the half measure section in the back row and put me in the ICU, the intensive care unit. He told me over and over again, I'm very sick and that my way doesn't work. And I, I could not understand that. I just graduated from nursing school. I was very smart. And uh, I had to tell everybody, hi, my name's Ted. I'm very smart. And uh, I just graduated from nursing school. I was making up for like 10 years of slutty, drunken behavior. And uh, I had to erase that as quickly as I could. And um, he put me on the path. I mean, I did my uh, fourth step with him after one month. He gave me a month to do it. He said, uh, I said, well, I've heard step a year. I've heard all this stuff. And he said, uh, you're very sick. You need to, how quick do you want to get well? That's how fast we're going to do the steps. We did the steps very quickly. One month I went out to Daly City and, uh, cause I was willing to go into any length. And, uh, I went out there and I knelt down on a, a shag carpet and, uh, <laughs> I want to say a dirty shag carpet. And, uh, my sponsor, we did the third step prayer and he said, tell me why you haven't done a fourth step in four years. And I said, because it says now about sex. And I, I, I have done all kinds of things in the last 10 years, and I'm ashamed. And he said, I feel sorry for you because you loathe and despise your sexual behavior. I want you to know it's God, your sex powers are God-given and therefore good, and I want you to start enjoying your sex life. I want you to put a chair next to the bed and invite God in to watch the show. <laughs> wow. It was, a, it was at that moment I thought, oh, wow, I like this guy. <laughs> Up until that minute, I wasn't so sure. But then he told me things about himself. And I'm a very judgmental person, if you haven't known me. Um, but he told me stuff about himself to put me at ease, but it put me in judgment. I thought, they should run him out of AA. Because 
because he's very he's a he's a womanizer and he's a predator in AA and he dates newcomers and all this stuff. I had a list of a litany of things why he wasn't a good sponsor. But when he t- when he was accepting and loving towards me and and made me feel welcome and told me about himself, I, I thought I could work with this guy. And then he, uh, he said, "Tell me what you don't want to tell anyone." Uh, after we did the four step, I said, "I did poppers in a sexual situation two week two months ago." And he said, "What are poppers?" Don't ever ask a newcomer anything, because the first thing they, they're going to do is lie, and that's what I did. My sponsor said, "I know you're lying because your lips are moving." And uh, but I, I try the, I always try to lie out and see if you believe it. If you believe it, I might believe it. Uh, so I said, he said, "Is it a drug?" Mm, no, I don't think it is. <laughs> and he he said, "What is it?" I said, mm, "I never really thought about it." Uh, and he defined a drug for me, and 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 uh, said. This is fabulous. He didn't say fabulous. I said fabulous. This is my story. He said, this is great. You're not even sober. I want you to change your sobriety date. Give up your four years. Go back to the meetings. Get out of that half measure section. Make a commitment. Stand up for something or you'll fall for anything. Sit in the ICU, the intensive care, because you're very sick. And you need a lot of help. And you need to sponsor people. That's the only help we we have for you in, in Alcoholics Anonymous. So... um he said, don't take a public opinion poll in AA because that's what keeps you so sick. Because you know how to find the people that agree with you. And then you both stay sick. So he put, he did, I did all this stuff. On faith, I, I, I had done the third step with him. And on faith, I went to the high noon, um, which was my home group at the time. And I remained there for many years, 13 years, to a long time. And uh, I, did, I, I sat, I remember I cried. I never showed any emotions in AA and I cried. And I changed my sobriety date, and I was rocketed into the fourth dimension. And it takes one experience of telling the truth about who you are and what you're doing in Alcoholics Anonymous, and then that will put you in AA. And I was in AA from visitor from visitor to member by one one event of telling the truth about who I am and what I'm doing in Alcoholics Anonymous. So my sponsor put me on a path. He said, "I want you to give your number to every newcomer and introduce yourself as somebody that knows how to work the steps." And uh, you know, you get smart really quick, and after a month, I was saying, other people don't do that. You know, I watch him. You got me looking stupid. <laughs> I mean, he said, I didn't do that. <laughs> but I said, other people don't talk to the newcomers. They don't chase them down like I'm doing and give them the number and tell them to call me and have book studies at my house. They don't have, he said, remember, you're very ill. <laughs> you know, they're probably not as sick as you are. So you have to do more. And uh, he told me, you get out of AA what you put into it. So... Isn't it five minutes yet? Um, uh, I gotta go. I'm talking really fast. Um, so he said, uh, you get out of AA what you put into it. And, uh, he, I put me on the firing line. That was in 1985. My new sobriety date he assigned to me, 1185. I said, I don't like that day. He said, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> he said, any plan to stay sober will work as long as it's not your own. And I really believe that. I, I mean, for entertainment purposes, I listen to my sponsee's plans. And then, <laughs> And, and then I might, if I can get it, get it in, I give him a suggestion. Because I'm not mean like my sponsor was. Um, I, I had made a vow that when I was a sponsor, I was going to be nice. That doesn't always work. Um, because sometimes you just have to say, shut the fuck up. And, oh, this is on tape. Oh, darn it. <laughs> anyway. Sometimes I try, I've tried it all. I've tried doing all kinds of ways. I make a lot of mistakes. I'm, I'm grateful to be sober. It's a blessing to be sober. I, I mean, I, I just have to say real quick, I, I, I was got an AIDS diagnosis in 97. I went on disability. I started uh, dealing with that. I was at, making bargains with God all the time. I said, just get me to the conference in 2000. I like the annual uh, international conference. And I was just praying, just get me to 2000. I just want to live that long. I mean, I'm, I, I short, uh, change myself all the time. And uh, I called my older sister, she doesn't like me to put that on tape either. And uh, I called my sister and I said, uh, I'm going to the conference. And she said, I joined AA. I'll meet you there. And so it, in 2000, I was with my my sister and we were in the uh, 2000 convention. And it was amazing to stand in that stadium and hold hands with the thousands of people and, and do the third step prayer and the serenity prayer. And just to be with a sibling. I have nine siblings. And uh, she was the first one to come into Alcoholics Anonymous. And then, so um, two and a half years ago, my other sister, who lives in Vallejo, um, she joined Alcoholics Anonymous after some events. 
she called me up in tears and she said, uh, I have to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and I was like, yes! <laughs> Thank God! And I said, oh, we'll get through this. <laughs> I didn't want to scare her away with my enthusiasm. So, uh, so it's just been a marvelous thing. We've been to four or five conventions together. We've been to the Hawaii convention three times. When I spoke over there, I talked her into dressing like a clown on, uh, I was dressed as a clown and I shared at the Hawaii convention and she was agreeable enough, new enough to uh, dress, <laughs> dress as a clown with me. And uh, my other sister refused. I wanted to be the three ring circus. And uh, my other sister was, was a little too sober to participate in my, my shenanigans. But, um, you know, we had a great time and now uh, it just, it's been a joy to stay sober long enough to experience the fellowship that's grown up around me. I, 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 sponsor a lot of guys. I mean, I do sponsor a lot of guys, and I don't only sponsor really good-looking, cute guys. That's, I wanted to dispel that myth. I heard it as soon as I got here today. Someone said, Ted only sponsors really good-looking guys, and if you, if somebody, somebody asks him, and, and Ted goes like this, I'm busy. Uh, and that's not true. I don't know if he ever saw me do that, but I don't think I've done that. But this is a gay meeting. I can talk about that. Um, <laughs> But the truth is, this is what I, 15 years ago, they accused me of the same thing when I had a bunch of sponsees that were really uh, handsome young men. And they said, Ted, you only sponsor the really good looking ones. And I said, I sponsor the really sick ones. They just happen to be good looking. <laughs> and I, I said, it's taught me something. The better you look, the sicker you are. <laughs> and so in Alcoholics Anonymous, if you're spending all that much time at the gym and fixing yourself up to go to an AA meeting, uh, where are the sluts? Uh, <laughs> You know, you just got to ask yourself, what got you here? And then stop that behavior. And uh, that's what I've had to do in the 26 years. I've had to evolve and change and grow. And every day is a new experience. If I wasn't sponsoring people, I wouldn't have grown an, a bit. Because what happens for me is the sponsees, they watch you. I mean, they, I lied about my age. I was 34 for six years. And, uh, you know... I had to make up for lost time. And uh, one of my sponsees says, Ted, that's not honest. And I said, yeah, but who cares? And uh, he said, but you've got to work an honest program. And I said, well, I'll, you know, I'll think about it. And he said, listen, wouldn't you rather have him say you look good for 40 than you look like hell for 34? And I said, oh, that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> so next month I'm turning 60, and that's the truth, and I'm happy about it. I couldn't be happier. Um, it's just a joy to be sober, and thank you very much. Thank you, Ted. <laughs> uh, let's welcome our second speaker, Gina B. from Sacramento, California. Everybody, I'm Gina B, and I am an alcoholic. Hi, Gina. We love you, Gina. Lots and lots and lots. All right, yay! That was fun. Woo! It gets better every time. Um, wow, it's like uh, before I was actually gay, right? Um, okay, so I didn't know it. I was the only one. Um, I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I spent a lot of time in straight AA because I was straight, right? Right? I only worked on cars and shot shotguns and went fishing and didn't have a boyfriend and, ugh, ugh, the thought sends chill, ugh. And, um, I love you. And then, uh, yeah, no. Gay and AA. A pivotal point in my sobriety has actually come to the realization that, oh my god, you might be a lesbian. Um, I had lots of people, I think by the time I was 13, my mom was like, are you gay? And I'd be like, oh my God, no. <laughs> I would walk away from that, you know, that, that little conversation, scratching my head, thinking, oh my God, what's gay? You know, I didn't even know, but I knew because of the stigma of what I've heard or going to school, and I mean, middle school by proxy, you're gay, ooh, gay jokes, blah, blah, blah. And I was living in the Bay, I think I was in Benicia, I spent a lot of time in, um, lived in Benicia and Concord for 13 years. And, um, so, so I grew up down here in the melting pot, you know, spent a lot of time in the Bay Area and, and I had friends that were gay. I didn't know. Right. Um, but I had this thing, but not me. Right. It wasn't okay for me. 
So I remember I got sober. I was about three and a half years into the thing, and I hadn't actually worked my steps because I didn't want to have to look at the fact that I might be a lesbian. So that thing, that one thing for me, it was actually very pivotal in my sobriety. I know I kind of like jumped to fast forward because I totally want to talk about the gay thing. This is so fun. Thank you. Uh, I know, right? Uh, you know, because, you know, in mainstream meetings, I usually tone it down just a little bit. Not me exactly, because I'm, I don't think I have a volume button. It's broken, I'm pretty sure. Um, but, but generally I tone it down a bit. But when I got here, I really didn't want to look at that stuff. I was afraid. And it wasn't that I knew how to do a four step actually really, because I didn't really understand the book right, because I wasn't working with a sponsor yet, like sitting down and reading the book. So I didn't really get a lot of the stuff that was in here. But I knew that if I looked at a, you know, looked at a four step and did a four step, they talked about, yeah, finding out, you know, what was good and bad in your life and who you were. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I could do that because what am I going to do if I'm gay? Right? What do you do? How do you act? How am I going to act if I'm gay? Right? Turns out, really not much different than I was <laughs> when I wasn't gay, turns out, really. And, and the thing that was really important that is, is I had this higher power and I had the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous that actually helped me through that. See, because I was absolutely unwilling to even try that whole gay thing out until I started to remember that Alcoholics Anonymous being sober, you guys have never let me down. The group of Alcoholics Anonymous as a whole, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the people, in a, the principles behind what we do here in Alcoholics Anonymous has kept me sober, right? Not drinking, miracle number one out of trillions. You know, so what makes me think, really, that it's not going to help me work through whatever I think or perceive to be a problem? And I thought this was a problem. I thought my perception of that was that it was a problem. So... With the shotgun in my mouth, not have done a four-step, thinking about just blowing my head off because I didn't want to be gay here with three and a half years sober, I was like, wow, okay, God. And we had a serious discussion for a couple minutes. And I was like, I am willing to turn this thing over to you because, you know, the people in Alcoholics Anonymous have told me we can do anything. You know, we can get through anything. We can be everything. We can be anything we want to be here. And I can get through it sober if I'm just willing to walk hand in hand with that creator I have. And so that's what I did. Finally, I took a real thorough, you know, third step, and I actually made that decision. My God got big enough to handle my gay problem, right? <clears throat> and it turns out that I put those Doc Martens on that day, and I haven't taken them off since, really. <laughs> you know? So now what do I do? Now I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous. All the people know me. It's like four years into this deal, and I'm like straight, Gina. Now what do I do? Hello, what anybody just coming out does, they buy rainbow freaking beads. And I cut my hair short. Well, not short. I cut it shorter. I wore ball caps. I could get away with it now, right? Because when you're gay, you could totally wear like a baseball hat now. Um, right? And so I was like, oh, my God, what do I do with all this energy? And what happened was, as I was in the foothills, I was sober, and I loved the people. And they just watched me spin over this thing, like, wow, what's happening with everybody? Oh, she found out she's gay. Oh, makes sense. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so they would just pat me on the back or the head or, you know, and oh, you just keep coming back, honey, you know? So I didn't know what I was doing. But what happened is, is I came down to, uh, I was up in the foothills, and I went to Sacramento, and I started to hang out with, like, the gay people. There was, like, a gay bar. Because what do we do? When you're gay, you go to the bar. Hello, what do you do if you're sober? Dude, that sucked. I was like, so now i got to go to the bar to meet people because that's what gay people do? It's like there's very few venues, seemingly, at the time that I knew about. But I was okay with that because I had, like, four years. I'm cool. Went to the gay bar. Oh, my God, the women were everywhere. I was like, I'm doing this all the time. Three nights a week, I was driving down, I was going to the bar, and someone said, hey, you want to go to a meeting? I'm like, a meeting in Sacramento? Are you kidding? They have them here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was I? I was like 21, 22, maybe. And they said, yeah, and there's a gay one. What? There's a gay AA meeting? And I was so ecstatic, and I was like, well, what's going to happen? I'm going to go in there, and there's going to be real gay people there, and oh my God, how... Oh. <laughs> I had all this anxiety about like not fitting in or being gay enough for you guys or... Uh. I'm okay now. Um, yeah. So I so I go to this meeting, and this is what happened for me. And I know it's kind of crazy, and it's maybe related, maybe not. But this whole in this whole thing intertwined for me. We're at a young people's conference right now, right here, absolutely home. 
I went to that meeting and I walked in there. And Alcoholics Anonymous is by far the biggest, best thing that's ever happened to me in life. In my life, hands down, period. Me being sober, number one, period. I am a member of Alcoholics Anonymous before I am anything else. Okay? So I walked in. Yeah. So I remember I walked into this meeting, and it was a women's meeting. And uh, I didn't know what she was doing. She did. So I walked into this meeting, and it's all, like, women. And there are, like, tons of cute women, like, everywhere. They're all sober. Half of them were young. And I'm like, oh, my God. I got so wound up. I was like, oh. And I would have, I almost cried because I found gay, sober, young people and Alcoholics Anonymous. And I was like, wow, they're all in the same room? I'm like, oh, my God. This is too much emotion for me. And I kept going. And I kept going because I found three of my favorite things all in one place. North, North Hall, yeah, right? North Hall Group of Alcoholics Anonymous is my home group. Um, Sacramento Downtown Young Peoples is my home group. Yes, that's right. I get two of them because I am a member there when I say so. You know, so I have two home groups. And, and what happened is, is through the process of going in there, right, I was like, wow, are they going to do stuff different now in gay AA? It's not. It's AA. It just happens that we all have brown hair. We all just happen to, you know, like glitter. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> you know, but it's Alcoholics Anonymous first. Alcoholics Anonymous first. You know, it's just like young people. We have the same thing. I hear it, you know, many, you know, we hear this topic that come up. Oh, the young people, AA separate, whatever. It's Alcoholics Anonymous first, you know, and I'm glad I got to be here without any type of affiliation whatsoever, one way or the other, any kind of, right? I am Alcoholics Anonymous. I just happen to be a part of young people's. I just happen to be gay also. I just, you know, all of these things, you know, and, and, and one of the interesting things about being um, a lesbian here in Alcoholics Anonymous is, is this whole sponsorship, male, male, female thing, thing goes out the window, <laughs> you know? It does, it does, it does. It just really doesn't fit that whole streamlined men got to sponsor men thing and women. Because I sponsor men and women now. I thought at first, I thought that was kind of weird, but ooh, I like this. This is fun, right? <laughs> what is it? You know, I can't remember the numbers, but you know the whole uh, 2000 whatever survey, Alcoholics Anonymous, what percentage of people in Alcoholics Anonymous are male? Anybody know? And like 70, 65, thank you. I'm like, it's like 70-ish. So you've got 65% of the population in Alcoholics Anonymous on average, male. So you got the other, what, 35% are female. If I'm only hanging around with the women all the time, I'm missing out on 65% of the knowledge about Alcoholics Anonymous that I could be having. I totally like the fact that I can, you know, get with guys in sponsorship fashion. That makes me happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, my, my sponsor, when I finally started getting serious about this thing, my first sponsor um, that I actually part, started working the steps with was female. God bless her. She loved me through the, that entire process of kind of figuring out who I was initially, and it was great. And then I moved down to Sacramento, and I got my, my, my next sponsor, who actually took me through the rest of the steps, was a male. God bless him. Loved him. You know, I walked into a room. We were in this big meeting, and he was at a business meeting, and he stood up and went, Rrr! and he screamed and raged at somebody, almost, about whatever we were having a very heated discussion about in our home group. And, and he was super pissed and passionate about it. I'll tell you that right now. I thought, God, that guy, look at him. He's on fire. And after the meeting, he went up to whoever we were, they, you know, they were in the heated discussion with. He said, dude, I'm such an ass. I'm so, and I, and I saw him take the principles of this program and go, uh, I totally see this deal. Totally my bad. Here, let me do whatever it is, you know. And that little exchange, I thought, that's, I want that guy. I told, I so want, you know why? I'm, I'm so not calm. That is not me. You know, and I want that guy because you know what? It, it, he did. He cleaned it up. He had his whatever it was and he cleaned it up and he cleaned it up right there. I want that guy. And he did and he took me through the rest of the steps. He was my sponsor for, I think, eight, eight, nine years until he moved away. You know, so that whole sponsorship, I love that fact that I get intermingled with everybody when it gets down to doing the deal, when it gets down to working steps with another human being. You know, um, Wow, what else has this meant to me? You know, it's like so, so many things, you know, so many things. I have learned so much with my home group, the camaraderie. And, and the intertwinedness that we get here, if you are gay 
and in AA. So we're, what, 10% of 10%, something like that. We all, like, run into each other all over the place. I'm like, oh, I know him. Where is he from? Oh, he's from San Diego, then San Francisco, then Portland, then Seattle. Why? Because that's where gay people go most of the time, right? The bigger cities. And so I, I get to know people, like, up and down the western seaboard, other places, too. But it's like this camaraderie. It's like we run into each other everywhere. For me, it's been even a closer sense of belonging at many times. You know, it's been a closer sense of, not that it doesn't happen that way for anybody else, but I, but for me, that has brought even more camaraderie into the relationships that I form here in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I have a host of friends that are absolutely fabulous, and I mean that, really fabulous, pink boas and all. You know, and I don't have to act any different, better, worse, in between than I do in any other meeting anymore. And they've taught me absolute acceptance of myself, that watching the other people go through the things that happen to gay people in general in this world. And I'm like, well, what do you do when this happens? It's like my family was pretty darn accepting, and I was I was really grateful. Of, oh, hello, remember my mom was asking me about being gay when I was 13? Yeah, and even when I told my grandma I have to talk to you about something, grandma's all like, what, who died? I'm like, nobody died. She goes, you're gay. I went, you know, why'd you got to do that? You know, it was no big deal for her. She obviously knew. You know, everybody knew but me, you know. And and I know, you know, after the fact that I just stayed anesthetized so much of my life before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. How could I figure it out? When I was drinking, the whole time I was drinking, I really was not looking for, where's it at? Where do you find the sluts? Okay. This was my card. Where do you find sluts in AA sobriety? Go to any given meeting, really. (laughs) You know, but when I was out there, I wasn't worried about hooking up with anybody. I wasn't worried about a boyfriend or girlfriend or any kind of friend. What I wanted to do is get to the party, give me my bottle, and get out of my way. I didn't, I was, I was no sexual. That's what I was when I was out there. And I just killed it. I killed anything about me. And that was included. So it took me about three and a half years to thaw out here in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, it took a long time and it was a real slow go. And I'm grateful. I've got to stay here. Hey, Ted, we, 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 we share the same birth date. Isn't that funny? The, the, you know, one, one, 1990 is my, um, sobriety date. Um, so, so since then, I haven't had to take a drink, and I've done it being gay, I've done it being young, you know, and I'm sober, and I'm sober still. Oh, where are we at? Are we out of time? I talk fast, so I have no concept. I've got six minutes. Mm-hmm. So, I do want to, <laughs> no, I don't want another topic. So really the most important thing for me is Alcoholics Anonymous helped me with that transition into becoming who I am today. Which it just so happens that I am gay, amongst other things. I also like, you know, fast cars, hmm, right? I also like to go fishing, hmm? I also like to, okay, I'm just not going to go through that list. But, um, you know, it's, and I didn't get to say this, I'm, I'm really grateful to the Icky Paw Committee for asking me to come be of service today. It is an absolute pleasure and an honor to be here and to be sober. You know, when I first got here, I used to sit at the tables in Alcoholics Anonymous next to people, and they used to shake so violently. Now it's five minutes. Thank you. (laughs) And I used to shake so violently at the table, I would spill other people's coffee. You know, they didn't chase me out of the meeting. They just went, ugh, oh, my God, you know, and they'd roll their eyes, and they'd pick their cops off, and they'd, you know, but next meeting when I sat down next to them, they never got up and moved. You know, because we are very tolerable here of each other. Because we have that common disease, you know, and then we have found a common solution. Being gay as well as being young and Alcoholics Anonymous is just one of the things that many people use to keep us separated from other people. I cannot afford to be separated from other people. I cannot afford to be separated from other people. I have the disease of alcoholism and I need everybody to help me stay sober. See, I don't want any of those things that I am today to be the one piece that's going to keep me just different enough from you to get me drunk. Because I don't know what that's going to be. And for a lot of people it is. I'm too dumb. I'm going to drink because it was just a phase. For some people it is. I'm too gay. In my fellowship there's not a very big gay contingency. Or maybe in some places, if you're in San Francisco, I'm not gay enough. (laughs) You know? But whatever that thing is, 
I found that I can associate with people not on necessarily what happens on the outside or any kind of labels what we have. But when you don't get what you want in your life, and it upsets you. The feelings you have behind it are exactly the same as the feelings that I get behind not getting something that I want or need in this program or in my life. The feelings behind the disappointment are exactly the same. Disappointment feels the same no matter what the circumstances, no matter what it is. You know, terror over something feels the same no matter what the circumstance is. You know, disappointment, terror. But you know what? Bewilderment, not understanding why I can't stop drinking. It doesn't matter. It feels the same. It feels the same no matter who you are. And that's the thread that I found here in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm exactly the same as you no matter what you look like. Because when that feeling comes up, that feeling is exactly the same. And then on that end of it is the solution is exactly the same. It's found in the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous in the book. And I can't believe I don't have a freaking book. I have my book in my room. And I'm always like, just, you know what I do? I assume that there would be a book at the podium. Look at me. <laughs> so in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, if you don't have one, get one. If you don't know what it is, ask somebody about it. Because in that book of Alcoholics Anonymous are where the steps are at. And those steps... Yeah, check it out, yo. This is a mini me version of the of the big book. Right? This contains like the uh chapters that have the steps in it, stuff like that. This is this will get you started if you don't have a big one until you get a big one. But this is what the little mini me version looks like. Vanna? Oh. <laughs> there you go. Um But those steps are the things that keep me sober and it and the steps don't care if I'm gay or not. The steps don't care if I'm young people or not. You know, and that's the great thing about Alcoholics Anonymous is I can be here no matter who I am. You know, I have a desire to stop drinking. That means I get to be here. I get to be here regardless of what you think of me. So, you know, with that, I'm, I'm really grateful to, to have the opportunity to be of service today. And it's really great to see, you know, lots of people I love and lots of people I just don't know I love yet. And, um, yeah, and thank you so much, guys. All right, thanks, Gina. So let's welcome our third and last speaker for this panel, Tom Jay from San Francisco. Hello, everyone. My name is Tom. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Tom. We love you, Tom. Uh, lots and lots. Oh. More. Louder. Oh. I like the last part the best, anyway. Uh, I want to, yeah, exactly. Uh, thank, I'd like to thank the, uh, the committee for inviting me to share at this panel. I uh, really appreciate the shares that I heard from Ted and Gina. I feel like I've just come from a really great AA meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so um, it's a really, it's a huge honor to be standing before you today. I, um, what I heard from both uh, Ted and Gina is that the two things about my life that I despise the most about me are today the two things that are the absolute greatest successes and defining aspects of who I am as an adult man. And that is that I'm an alcoholic sober and alcoholics anonymous and I'm a gay man uh, who has managed one day at a time to continue to live comfortably in my own skin as a result of this program. And if you're new, I want to welcome you to AA. And I want to tell you that you never have to pick up a drink or a drug one day at a time for the rest of your life. And it's also possible to be comfortable in your own skin under all conditions. And those were the promises that were given to me when I was new in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I was 22 years old when I came to my first meeting on April 11th of 1987, and I haven't had a drink since. I'm sober more than half my life, and I'm sober twice as long as I drank. And this April celebrated 24 years of sobriety. And uh, <clears throat> I don't say that to impress you, but it really impresses the hell out of me. <laughs> you know, because I knew that my problem was that I was not an alcoholic. In fact, my, my problem um, was the rest of you. <laughs> you know, and if you really understood how I felt inside, that you would say, you know, that poor guy, he really does need to drink, you know. And uh, I knew you'd say, if 
you knew how I felt inside that you would think it's perfectly acceptable for me to steal from you. Um, I knew that because you're nice people, you know. And uh, But uh, the fact is, in the last five years of my drinking, I was a daily drinker. As I said, I would have been drinking for about 11 years. I don't have any concept of what we hear around AA of crossing this invisible line. You know, you've heard that expression, right? You know, this the line that separates social drinking from abject alcoholism. I think that was probably somewhere right before the first drink hit my lips, you know, was a line there. Because all I know is I like to get as drunk as I can, as fast as I can. I'm the kind of person that, you know, gets so drunk that I throw up and then I go back to drinking. I love bed spins. I'm so drunk I can't walk, but I can drive, you know. And I make all these really, really great decisions that uh, at the time seemed like great decisions. And then, you know, after a little bit of uh, sober reflection, realized it was probably not such a great idea. You know, uh, so that when my first sponsor said to me, you know, that uh, I'm a menace to myself and to society at large, and it's probably a good idea that I figure out that soon, and that uh, I might have a chance in this program. And um, so uh, I don't want to get too much in the drunkalogue, except that I do think it's really important to qualify, um, because the the value of what we give to one another is our stories. You know, storytelling in AA is how we share this message of hope and recovery. And I have always found that to be the case in my very first meeting. Because I'm the kind of person, if somebody even starts, like, their eyebrows twitch, you know, as if they're trying to somehow, like, you know, do this finger-jabbing thing in your chest, you know, the hair on the back of my neck stands straight up, and I'm out of here. And my mind just closes like that. And I've not found that to be how uh, the message of AA has been delivered. Um, I, uh, I really appreciate people that uh, come to, to this program you know, either from a nudge from the judge, from, uh, you know, a DUI, let's say, or, you know, they somehow figured out that it is in the phone book and they call central office and ask for a meeting. Um, that is not how I came here. Uh, how I came here is that my, um, my drug dealer bartender boyfriend that uh, was really hot who turned to me onto crystal methamphetamine. Yes, they did have crystal in 1986. I love these people that say, you know, they didn't call it crystal, they called it crank. I'm like, whatever, you know. It ended up in my veins, and, you know, I, um, ugh, it was crazy. Anyway, that's the one thing I said I was never going to do, you know. Um, and, it, again, it took a while of sober reflection to realize what happens for me when it comes to my relationship with drugs and alcohol. And pretty much every step of the way that I have figured out how I want my life to look and who I want to be surrounded with, you know, I have this vision about, you know, this guy that has potential, you know. I was, that was my big thing. I was somebody who had potential. You know, lots of potential. Um, and, uh, but when it came to drugs and alcohol, whatever that line ended, I just picked up the line and I moved it, you know, and often did that. Um, so by the time I got here, um, I was like, I was what I'd like to affectionately refer to as gay roadkill. Um, I had been living in a bathhouse the last nine months of my drinking and using. Um, I uh, swear to God, I don't ever recall a conversation with anybody, and I remember spending most of the last year of my drinking and using in a towel, and not much more. Um, and uh, so this guy that was uh, my, uh, my bartender, crystal meth dr drug dealer boyfriend, um, said to me one day, he said, well, you know, there's this guy, he's really funny, he used to be an actor in Hollywood in the 1940s and 50s, and he's having a birthday party. Uh, and this was in Southern California in Encino in June. And uh, if you've ever been to Encino in the month of June, it's about 170. And, um, you know, by this point, I hadn't seen the light of day in, two, in about two years. Um, and, uh, you know, this is an instance actually where people-pleasing actually played well for me because, uh, you know, I really wanted this guy's approval. And so I went to this party, and the man that was having his his birthday, it was his 60th birthday, uh, was the strangest guy. He was sort of like this little elf-like character, you know, and I was a, I was especially afraid of older gay men then, and I'd only been out of the closet the last year of my drinking, and uh, he had this light in his eyes that was really powerful, and I saw this group of people show up for him on this very hot Saturday afternoon in June, you know, and they uh, obviously made sacrifices to be there. And there were young couples with their kids and little old Jewish ladies. And there's a guy that wrote his doctoral dissertation on tea rooms 
<clears throat> and I don't mean the kind that serve tea. Um, <laughs> There was a couple guys that were like, you know, in porn, a guy that, you know, was a Catholic priest. I mean, it was just weird, this group of people. But every time somebody went up to him, they just sort of burst into this expression of joy. And I hadn't been around a group of people that were absolutely elated to be with somebody else. And this guy was, he just, the way he carried himself intrigued me. And I sort of like was hovering in the back until I was introduced to him. And he was also from the Pacific Northwest, which is where I'm from. And, and he turns to this, this woman and there was a full bar there. Um, no, sorry, there wasn't a full bar there, which is one of the reasons why I never went to places like that. Cause I always went where there was a full bar. And, um, he said the strangest thing. He said, you know, I'm an alcoholic, but I haven't had a drink in 15 years. I thought, well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, you know? Why in the hell would you say you're an alcoholic and not have a drink in 15 years? But it intrigued me. And uh, so I will, uh, I'll fast forward here. So essentially, um, I became friends with this guy, and he had mentioned that um, he had written a book about his experience as an actor in Hollywood in the 1940s and the 1950s. And Rock Hudson had just died of AIDS, and book publishers were very excited about Hollywood kiss and tell novels and... Uh, so this book in manuscript form was uh, sort of a hot commodity. And um, he um, allowed me to read a copy of this manuscript. And it wasn't a story of, of Hollywood at all. It was a story of his drinking. And that's where the seeds of Alcoholics Anonymous were planted for me. And there was one part in particular that really struck me. And that is that after, it was in 1963, and he had went from having this career as a, a juvenile actor in Hollywood to uh, being at the State Mental Institution in Camarillo for uh, treatment for being gay and for being alcoholic which included massive doses of Thorazine and electric, electroshock therapy, which is what they did with us in the 1960s. And um, he was coming out of one of these sessions and sitting in the, this room and mounted in the corner of this, this uh, rec room was a television set. And playing on this television set was his uh, first film that he had done after arriving in, in L.A. after 10 days. And seeing his life go full circle, you know, I don't have that kind of story of, you know, having dreams and hopes and aspirations, but I certainly know what it feels like, you know, to set all that stuff aside in favor for alcohol and drugs, because alcohol and drugs matter more than the affection of friends and family, you know, a promising future, you know, a loving, you know, productive, useful life, you know, none of that stuff mattered when I was drinking and using, but I wasn't done drinking and using, <laughs> and so I asked this man, because uh, I was getting evicted from my apartment, if I can rent a room from him, and, uh, you know, sort of, um, get my life together, and I lived in this place the last, uh, you know, few months of my drinking, which I say euphemistically because I would leave the house, get to the bar. Usually the bars in West Hollywood weren't making the drink strong enough or fast enough, so I'd end up in the tattletale lounge in Culver City where they really know how to make drinks, and um, by about 11, leave there to go to Max Bathhouse in Silver Lake, which is now a chiropractor's office. You know, everything changes. Just to want to let you know that. Um, and... Um, you know, come to, come out of there about five. You know how embarrassing it is to be at a bathhouse at a Tuesday, you know? And then usually there'd be some stupid queen at the cashier that would say something like, you want to have your mail forwarded here, you know? And I'm like, this is not very good customer service. You know? <laughs> but then I realized on a Tuesday when nobody's in the bathhouse except me, you know, that I'm having sex with all the employees anyway. Um, yeah, get roadkill, that's what I mean. Um, and, you know, drive home. And uh, so on April 8th, I came to at this bathhouse on no different from any other time, except I didn't have any recollection of how I'd gotten there. And I came to as sober as I am this very moment, having sex with somebody I'd never talked to. And it terrified me, you know. And I was driving home at 7.30 in the morning, and I saw the coming the opposite direction people who had clearly had, you know, what cars that they washed, and they had eight hours sleep, and, you know, I knew that they'd hugged their kids before they went to bed and hugged them after they left work that morning. They had probably breakfast, they probably exchanged Christmas cards, they probably went to Disneyland, you know, they probably remembered what they said and done to the people that they cared about over the week, you know. They had an idea of what they wanted their life to look like going forward, and I didn't have a clue about any of that stuff, nor had I had a clue about it in a long, long time. And it sort of struck me that I had no idea how my life came to this point. And all I had to do was just go home and knock on that man's door and ask for his help. And and I get really nostalgic, and I'm trying to move into my 
sort of the important parts of the last 24 years, but I would have never made it to you guys if it wasn't for those critical days and those critical moments, you know, where I was hopeless and desperate. And if you're new and you're feeling hopeless and desperate, you know, I want to welcome you to, uh, you know, because that's what I needed in order to be able to hear the message here. And I'm grateful that I managed to land in, in a time and a place with a sponsor. This man became my sponsor. As I told you, he was a skid row drunk, and his story was nothing like mine, and I really appreciated hearing that. Because what he said is that, you know, most alcoholics have to be pretty badly beaten up in order to get this, you know, and uh, you may not be done. And somehow hearing those words, I may not be done, was really jarring. And he said, uh, you know, there's some things that it's probably recommended that I go to 30 meetings in 30 days, 10 miles away from the meeting the night before, and I did that, you know. And uh, he said, it's a good idea. You probably, you know, don't drink. Try AA for 90 days. And if after 90 days you don't like what we have, we'll refund your misery. And um, I thought, well, okay. So I did that. And I went to my first meeting. It was at uh, the Valley Club in North Hollywood. And it was this weird noon meeting. And, um, you know, these people were, like, smiling. And there was lots of teeth and lots of laughter. And, uh, you know, I was convinced I was the only gay person in that room. And, uh, you know, the secretary got up and said, would any newcomers like to take a welcome chip? And I got up to take a welcome chip, and I said, I never drink with any of you assholes, and I don't think I'd want to get sober with any of you. And they laughed, like this guy, you know? <laughs> I'm thinking, these people are weird. You know, but at the break, the meetings ended, we're an hour and a half, and they had a break, and there was this older woman that cornered me at the uh, table where they were serving coffee. And uh, she said, honey, do you have any questions about anything you've heard? And I said, well, you know, I do. Because I have this problem that whenever I, I drink gin, you know, I end up, you know, hitting parked cars and, you know, rear-ending cars and left-hand turn lanes and coming to in places that I don't really want to be. And, and I'm not sure what I can drink so that this wouldn't happen. And she said, seven up. And I said, no, you don't understand. And she said, no, you don't understand. The problem is the first drink. If you don't pick up the first drink, you won't get drunk. And that's the only thing I hadn't tried in the last five years. I had tried everything else. I tried moving into a sober environment. That was going to stop my drinking. I thought moving closer to the bar was going to do it. I tried everything that I could possibly think of except not picking up the first drunk. And I went home and I talked to this man who I asked to be my sponsor. And he said, uh, you know, this is a program of self-identification. You know, we don't tell other people they're alcoholic. You have to find that on your own. But I recommend that you find it out and you find it out quickly. Because if you are, this disease is cunning, baffling, powerful, patient, and jealous. And uh, it has this way of convincing yourself that the first drink sounds like a good idea, you know. And I somehow got that the third step, the third tradition, rather, that we see posted in meetings says that the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. And as a 22-year-old in AA, I hung on to that. I didn't know I was alcoholic, but I knew I didn't want to drink again, you know. And I can tell you that the fear of getting loaded and the third tradition will keep you sober about four years. And beyond that, you better find another way to do it. And I was at that point at four years where I had uh, been to all these meetings. You know, I think it was about 90 days, maybe four months over when I heard about gay meetings. And somebody said, you know, they're gay meetings. I thought, that's gross. You know, my only idea was, you know, the bathhouses. I figured everybody was going to like be hitting on me and wearing towels. It was really weird. I, I was crazy. Yeah, I was crazy. Um, and I finally went to my to the, this gay meeting in West Hollywood, and nobody paid any attention to me. I was really upset. I really was, you know. But I was also standing like this, you know, looking very angry and had this body language of stay the hell away. And, <clears throat> and then I got, you know, a year of sobriety, and I developed all these friends in AA, and it was fun. And, you know, I'm grateful that my sponsor didn't say, no sex in your first year, you know. I'm really grateful because the men in gay meetings and Alcoholics Anonymous help me to be able to feel comfortable, you know, in my sexuality as a sober man. And, um, you know, and then I reached this point after a year of sobriety, you know, there's this woman who speaks in L.A. Like, I'm going to steal her line. She says, you know, pat me on the head and my pants would fall down. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened to me. Oh, my God. I had, seriously, there was this meeting in L.A. It was uh, hundreds of people. And I think I had probably had sex with two-thirds of the room. <laughs> and... Um, you know, I reached this point. I was three and a half years sober, and I wanted to die because I hadn't worked the steps, and I didn't have a relationship with a higher power. And I had fallen in love with this guy, and I didn't know how to communicate my feelings. And uh, A, 
you know, I remember thinking, you know, I have to go to a meeting. Uh, and I was in Laguna Beach at this, this beach party and we drove to, uh, you know, I was driving back and, uh, I thought, I can't make it. I'm not going to make it to the meeting. And I went to a liquor store and I was going to buy a bottle that day and drank. And in the liquor store was somebody who was buying a pack of cigarettes who was in AA. And I thought, okay, well, I guess I get it. You know, maybe there is a higher power out there. And, um, so, uh, by the time I got home, I thought, well, what do you do? You know, you have to call people. So I went to my phone book. We didn't have, with phone books, you know, and <laughs> lots of phone books. I know. I went through. I have four of them with people who have died from AIDS in AA or have died from suicide or died from this disease that I just can't seem to get out of the box with the rubber hand around it. Um, and uh, so I went to my phone book and I looked at the phone book and the only numbers there were people that I had had sex with in AA or wanted to have sex with in AA. And I thought, well, this isn't going to work. So I thought, oh, I better go to a meeting. And I went to a meeting that night, and the guy who was the speaker of that meeting was a member of the Pacific Group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Southern California, and he told a story that I had never heard before. Maybe I was hopeless and desperate again at four years and was willing to hear the message that I hadn't heard yet. And that's where I really believe that I started my sobriety, because I learned the importance of developing a foundation in this program. You know, up to that point, I was going to the meeting not to drink, and I was working the steps not to drink, and I was working with this sponsor not to drink. And no time along the way had I devoted any time in learning how to live sober. You know, learning how to be honest, to have a, be a person of integrity, to have a sense of um, acceptance about who I am. You know, this this thing that that we hear in the book about acceptance is the answer. You know, I knew still along the way that, you know, I didn't particularly like the idea that I was a gay man. And I particularly hated the fact that I was a young, sober gay man in Southern California in the late 80s as everybody in my community was dying of AIDS. I hated that, you know. And I love seeing guys getting sober today, you know, in 2011, where being sober and being gay is a joyful experience. I love that, you know. And there's a part of me that feels very jealous, too, you know, because I was going to meetings in my first four years, and I was angry at God, you know, because I thought, these people that are teaching me how to live, and the only thing going on in their life is how to deal with death, you know, and AA meetings, some of them felt like an infirmary, you know, and it was a horribly difficult time, but what I saw was one after another of these gay men that got up, that had plenty of reasons to drink and use and get up and they would say one after another we don't drink or use no matter what you know and their no matter what's have been incredibly bigger than any of my no matter what's I can assure you of that you know and the commitment to recovery and the dignity that they carried and the 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 obligation that they carried that they felt that they were the the beacon of sobriety to tell the, the newcomer coming in that they never have to live like that again. You know, it was an astonishing, awesome thing to witness, and it has changed um, my understanding of the higher power working in my life, because before I felt nothing but resentment and anger toward God, and today I see that these were people that, um, if it wasn't for their commitment and their maturity and their, their, um, their love, you know, love and service is the hallmark of what we give to one another here. You know, is uh, I wouldn't be sober today. You know, and over the time I've been sober in the last 24 years, you know, there have been pretty dark places, as there will be, you know, because that's life. You know, and every time I come to a meeting and I have an opportunity to talk to a newcomer, I see myself. You know, I see the person that's walked in not knowing what the next 30 days is going to be like, whether I can make it to 30 days. I see... You know, the people who have rallied around me when I was in my most vulnerable to come to uh, to carry me to that next place. You know, and I've never found that anywhere else other than Alcoholics Anonymous. Forgive me for being emotional and nostalgic. Um, I'm moved and I'm honored to be a member of this program. You know, I continue to come back to AA for those reasons. I continue to work with others for those reasons. And I know many people that have, for whatever reason, decided that um, you know, maybe AA isn't enough for them, you know, or that work is too much, or the new boyfriend is too much, and AA is too time-consuming, or the newcomer is too difficult, you know. I know lots of people that are sober a long time who are afraid of newcomers and don't sponsor, you know. And if you're one of those, I got some advice for you. <laughs> 
you know, sponsoring others is like making, making toast. You have to burn the first 10 slices before you get it right. <laughs> the 11th slice, you'll be fine, you know. And, um, you know, I've learned more from the privilege of being able to give it away than I've received, and that's the, that's the beauty of this, you know. I, um, I want to tell you, if you're new, welcome to San Francisco. If you are, you know, just coming out, it's a great life being gay in 2011. If you are been around and you're feeling like, you know, I really need to get this shot in the arm and get my, uh, my program rejuvenated, it can happen today. It can happen today, you know. And uh, if you're wondering whether you actually are an alcoholic, keep coming back. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.